Bonjour, I'm Antoine. Today on interview, Rox Hoyerman, owner of RH Consultant, a department of building facilitator. Let's go meet him. Tell us, you know, who you are, uh, you know, where you're from, and how long you've been in New York. Okay. Um, Rex Hewerman, I'm an architect. I'm an architectural consultant. I'm a troubleshooter. Born and raised on Long Island. Okay. Been right. working in Manhattan since 1987. Rex, did you do it? After years of unanswered questions, a break in the unsolved Gilgo Beach murders out of Long Island. As officials announce a suspect is now in custody. The suspect is 59-year-old Rex Hewerman of Massapequa Park. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all doing super, super well. Welcome to part two of the Gilgo 4 investigation. I highly recommend that you guys go watch part one so you guys can hear more about the victims, how they went missing, and about the investigation. So I will link that down below. I had to make this a part two video just because there is a lot of information to go over. I think this is the first part two that we've ever done on this channel before. I'm pretty sure. I normally like to do everything in one part, but can you imagine how long that video would have been? I think the first part was like an hour and 15 minutes plus this video it would have been like two hours long so yeah sorry about dividing it but I really appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to part two today we're gonna be talking about who Rex Hurman is and how a thrown out pizza led to his arrest as a Long Island serial killer yeah a pizza pretty much sealed this case it's just shocking how it took over a decade for there to finally be an arrest and I just can't imagine how difficult it must have been for the victims families you know just waiting so long for justice we still aren't there yet you know a trial still has to happen a conviction still has to happen I mean there are so many more steps that need to be taken but hopefully with this arrest the families are just one step closer to justice and closure as I mentioned in part one all of my sources will be linked down below as well as any additional information regarding the investigation just in case you guys want to look more into it now real quick before we get into today's video I do just want to take a moment to thank our sponsor who helps support this channel and the team behind it Thank you to AG1 for sponsoring today's video. AG1 is a daily foundational nutrient supplement that supports whole body health. Instead of addressing one area of the body, foundational nutrition supplements further elevate our baseline health by supporting the essential and universal needs our body has each day to thrive. From nutrient replenishment, stress management, gut optimization, and immune support. I've incorporated AG1 into my morning routine. It's just so refreshing to have this in the morning. One of the reasons I started drinking AG1 is because I really want to work on my gut health, on my energy, and I just want to have health your habits. AG1 sources the best and high quality ingredients it can find and it has so many benefits. I'll leave a couple of the benefits here on the screen for you guys, but you guys can read more about it in the link below. Every batch is NSF certified for sport, the gold standard for those who must follow strict rules regarding the use of supplements and nutritional products and ensures you're getting exactly what's on the label. As an added measure of quality, their manufacturing facilities are TGA registered. This regulatory body verifies the strictest compliance standards in the world. It's so easy to use AG1 and it honestly tastes so good. Go to drinkag1.com slash Jackie Flores or scan the QR code on the screen to get your free welcome kit that includes a canister, shaker, a year supply of vitamin D3, K2, and an extra five travel packs of AG1. Thank you again to AG1 for sponsoring today's video. Okay, so the last video ended with authorities finally having a lead. On March 14th, Rex Andrew Hureman was named as a possible suspect in the Gilgo Beach murders. Police Commission Rodney Harrison said, quote, once we got the car, who it was connected to, that's when the investigation got legs. According to Amber's roommate Dave, the man who was driving the green Chevy Avalanche that was parked outside of Amber's house the night she disappeared was white, large, very tall, big built, mid 40s or 50s, had dark bushy hair, and also had these big oval style 1970s type eyeglasses. Okay, honestly, just talking about this tip, it's crazy how Dave gave police this information over 10 years ago. Literally a few days after Amber went missing, he told police all of this information, but it took them so long to finally start looking for the owner and the driver of this green Chevy Avalanche. It's just so frustrating. And you know, we'll get back to like what Dave has to say about their finally being an arrest, but I just can't imagine how he feels because he literally gave police this information 10 years ago and they barely looked into it. So. 
by combing through vehicle registration, Rex was found. He had owned a green Chevy Avaland at the time of Amber's murder. He did end up selling the car to his brother later on, so it was no longer at his home, you know, when he was arrested. However, it was in his ownership during the time of all of these murders. He also matched the description of Dave, who described him nearly to a T. You know, he's big, he's ogre looking, Frankenstein looking, you know, big build, tall, everything. Rex also lived very close to where the victims were found in Massapequa Park, which is just 20 to 30 minutes away from Gilgo Beach. This was a huge lead, but could this person really be who investigators were actually looking for? Because this guy Rex was kind of like normal. And I put normal in quotation marks because he looks normal on the outside, but that opinion quickly fades as soon as you dig deeper into him. Rex had a successful architectural business located in Midtown Manhattan called RH Consultants and Associates, which he had since 1994. The company was pretty successful since they worked with well-known and established companies. Besides his own business, Rex also had a family and he had kids. And again, to everyone, he just looked normal on paper. So let's talk a little bit more about Rex. 59-year-old Rex Andrew Hureman was born in 1963 and grew up in Massapequa Park in Long Island, New York, with his parents Dolores and Theodore, along with his younger brother named Craig. They lived at 105 First Avenue in Massapequa Park their entire lives. Now, there isn't much information about Rex's parents other than that his father passed away in 1975 when Rex was just 12 years old. And as for his mother Dolores, I believe she is still alive and as of last year, she is 94 years old. So we don't know much about his parents, but we do know a little bit about his brother Craig. On February 27th, 1998, Craig was actually arrested for driving intoxicated and killing a police captain named Winian Buskey. Winian was pronounced dead at the scene and Craig pled guilty and spent three years in prison. He had an alcohol level of twice the legal limit and a blood cocaine level of 0.5 milligrams. So he was very intoxicated. Other than that, which is like a huge thing, the fact that he you know, killed someone and went to jail. He is currently living in South Carolina, but again, that's pretty much all I could find on Craig. Going back to Rex, his old classmates said that they remember him being kind of like the punching bag at school. He wasn't really like a popular guy and he had very poor social skills. He was very smart and, you know, people remember him being very good at school and also him being a big guy which yeah he is a very big guy he is between 6'5 and 6'6 so he is a very very tall man like if you watch the videos of him being arrested and just standing next to other people it's actually crazy he's just so tall and not only is he tall but he's also just like big like he kind of has like a belly and he's also just kind of like thick. So he really is a massive guy. Lifelong neighbors of Rex's family have come out and they state that there were often fights heard from the Hureman house and that it was kind of known that Rex didn't really have a good relationship with his father. So Rex grew up in this house his whole childhood and young adult years. He ended up getting a degree in architectural technology and then he married his first wife named Elizabeth Ryan in 1990. And then from there, he bought his childhood home from his mom in 1994. Shortly after this, he made his own architect company called RH Consultants and Associates, which I mentioned earlier, and that was located in Midtown Manhattan. After a couple of years went by, he ended up divorcing his first wife, and then he met his second wife named Asa Ellerup, and they got married in 1996. They lived together in his home with their children, Victoria and Christopher. Christopher is Rex's stepson, and Victoria is a child that Rex and his wife Asa made together. <laughs> I don't know how to word that. Now, Victoria eventually joined her dad and actually worked at his office in New York City. There isn't much information about what Asa did in her day-to-day, -day, but Asa was from Iceland and she would go visit her home sometimes with their children while Rex stayed behind working. So he had a normal job, a thriving business, and again, just honestly seemed like a regular guy. However, some neighbors have made some comments about Rex being strange. They state that Rex would sometimes burn his 
trash in his backyard and that one neighbor would often think to himself like, why is this guy burning his trash again? Or for example, Rex would sometimes just sit in his car that he had parked in front of his house for periods of time. In another incident, a neighbor actually had to tell Rex to stop peeking at his wife who would sunbathe in their backyard, which is just such a creepy thing to do. I mean, what is this guy doing? Other neighbors state that Rex was quiet and, you know, kept to himself and kind of just gave off like a creepy vibe of, you know, somebody that you don't really want to approach or talk to. So he wasn't very popular at school and he wasn't very popular in his neighborhood either. As for Rex's co-workers, they state that Rex was overly fastidious, adversarial with everybody, and just cold and distant. One co-worker named Muriel says that she remembers Rex like talking about himself way too much. She also said that he was always running to and from job sites and just like eating junk food and fast food, pizza in particular. So she kind of describes him as like, a grimy guy. She said that he was an avid hunter and that he had a lot of photos of his hunting trips in the office. She did recall a strange incident that kind of rubbed her the wrong way. So she had booked a cruise trip for her 40th birthday and she told Rex about her plans and he asked her, where are you going? And she replied, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be in the middle of the ocean. You're not going to find me in the middle of the ocean. And he replied with, oh yes, I can. Now, two days into her cruise trip, she noticed that there was a white envelope underneath her door and that inside it was a note from Rex which read I told you I could find you anywhere which is just extremely eerie and just so freaking weird it just honestly made my stomach feel so disgusting because why does this guy feel like that's an appropriate thing to do another co-worker named Mary said that Rex would keep bear meat in his freezer for months and also said that Rex would sometimes make comments about women's bodies for example if they gained weight he would make a comment about it which again what the heck is this guy doing? Like, how does he think he has a right to comment on anyone's appearance when he looks like how he does. So yeah, that's kind of the gist of who Rex is and how people saw him, which isn't really that good. I mean, yeah, people say that he was quiet, that he would sometimes keep to himself, but the majority of the people feel like there was just something off about him. So going back to the investigation, police had to be very careful and sure before they made any announcements of him being a possible suspect. Detectives honed in on Rex and they did a very thorough investigation where they obtained 300 subpoenas, search warrants, and other legal processes to determine his involvement in the Gilgo Beach killings. Now, a major and just very important discovery was made through phone billing records. If you recall from part one, each victim was contacted by a burner phone before their murder. Phone billing records revealed that the general locations of the burner phone used to initially get in contact with the victims after responding to their ads on Craigslist were locations that Rex's own personal cell phone pinged at as well. The pings were off cell towers closest to his office in Midtown Manhattan and close to his house in Massapequa Park. So let's talk about what this means. Starting with Marine, according to the bail application between July 6, 2007 and July 9, 2007, which is the day that Maureen disappeared, there were 16 interactions with Maureen's phone and a burner phone organizing a meetup. The last activity on Maureen's phone was on July 9th at around 11.56 p.m. in the Midtown Manhattan area. Three days later, however, Maureen's phone had activity again. It was used to check her voicemail near the Long Island Expressway in Islandia. Next, let's talk about Melissa. Melissa's phone interacted with a burner phone on three occasions, on July 6, 2009, on July 9th, and on July 10th. On July 10th, which was the day that she disappeared, the burner phone that was used to contact Melissa traveled from Massapequa Park to Midtown Manhattan. Remember, Rex lives in Massapequa Park and works in Midtown Manhattan. Later that day, Melissa's own cell phone traveled from Midtown Manhattan to Massapequa Park. The last activity on Melissa's phone was on July 11th, 2009 at 1.43 in the morning in Massapequa Park. Later on in the day of July 11th and the day of July 12th, Melissa's phone was used to check her voicemail in Babylon, New York, and it remained inactive for a few days. And then on July 17th, 23rd, and then on August 5th, it was used again. Something that ties into this discovery is that Rex had actually traveled to Iceland with his family on August 9th, 2009. And then from that day on, there were no more taunting calls made from the burner phone. Then on August 18th, Rex got back home from his trip to Iceland 
Iceland, and the Taunton calls began again the following day on August 19th and continued on August 26th when Melissa's cell phone was used to make the taunting cell phones to her sister Amanda, which we discussed in part one. And the taunting calls were made from Midtown Manhattan. Notice a pattern? Now, let's talk about Megan's cell phone. On June 5th, 2010, Megan's phone interacted with a burner phone. Then again, on June 6th, 2010, at around 1.31 in the morning, which is the time that she was caught on surveillance footage alive for the last time. Then, Megan's phone traveled to Massapequa Park at around 3.11 in the morning. Notice another pattern? Massapequa Park and Midtown Manhattan are the main two locations where these burner phones and the victim's phones were pinging. Now, let's talk about Amber's cell phone. On September 2nd, 2010, Amber's phone interacted with a burner phone that was near Massapequa Park at around 11.34 p.m. Then, at around 12.05 a.m., Amber's phone interacted with the burner phone again, which this time, the burner phone was in West Babylon, the city where Amber lived, in proximity to Amber's home. This is allegedly when the scheme that Baron, Dave, and Amber would do went wrong. Because remember in part one, how I mentioned that they would do a scheme where Amber would have a client in the living room and then Dave and Bear or one of them would come in pretending to be the husband and then the client would leave and Amber and then would get to keep the money without her actually having to have with the man. So then one time the scheme went bad and this Frankenstein looking guy got mad at Amber and at her roommates for doing the scheme. Then after the guy left, he texted Amber from a burner phone saying that what they did wasn't very nice and that he would like a credit for his next visit. Well, that message was sent from a burner phone in Massapequa Park at around 1.18 in the morning. Then later that day on September 2nd at around 9.32 p.m., Amber's phone interacted with the burner phone again, this time with the burner phone being in Midtown, Manhattan. Then the burner phone traveled to Massapequa Park and interacted with Amber's phone again at around 10.39 p.m. and 11.05 p.m. Then at around 11.17 p.m., the burner phone traveled to West Babylon in proximity to Amber's home again. She was last seen that night. This is where the green Chevy Avalanche comes into play, which again, if you recall, Amber's roommate said that he saw her go inside a green Chevy Avalanche with a big ogre looking guy. Then she disappeared. So I know that was a lot of information, a lot of like call logs and numbers and everything, but it's all very important information because this is literally one of the biggest pieces of discovery against Rex. I mean, literally all of these calls to the victims were coming from either Midtown Manhattan or Massapequa Park, which again is where Rex lives and where he works. They were all coming from a burner phone. And again, Rex's personal cell phone was literally at those same locations at the same time as the burner phone. So I know it's a lot, but it's very important. Going back to the case, Police now knew that the green Chevy Avalanche was in ownership of Rex at the time of the killings and that his cell phone was pinging in all of these same spots as these burner phones used to contact the victims. It was just such a huge discovery. According to the bail document, quote, investigators could find no instance where Humerman was in a separate location from these other cell phones when such a communication event occurred. In addition to the interactions on these burner phones being linked to Rex with the victims, investigators were also able to link very various online accounts to Rex. Investigators discovered reoccurring payments on Google Pay for Tinder. That Tinder account was linked to a burner phone ending in 1697 and was associated with the email springfieldman9 at aol.com under the name Andy, which actually Andrew happens to be Rex's middle name, which Andy could be short for. That email account was created using a fake name of John Springfield, and they also use a zip code from Astoria, Queens, New York and a different burner phone ending in 2671. Later, investigators found that Rex's own personal cell phone accessed this Springfield man email on December 11th, 2022. Investigators also found selfies of Rex that were sent to escorts while arranging their encounters using this email. So yeah, so this guy, this husband and this father created this Tinder account with these fake names and with these burner phones, everything, and then would use that to hire escorts and just talk to other women and just send them these selfies which I mean these selfies are just 
They're definitely something. One of the conversations between him and an escort was, quote, Hi, I saw your ad and wanted to see if we could set something up later. The woman replied with, quote, I'm done for the day. Does tomorrow work? And Rex replied with, I am working all day. I was free today. My wife is out for the day. Which... God, that just, God, what a disgusting man, right? Like saying my wife is out for the day. Like this guy is married and has children. Another email discovered was hunter1903a3 at gmail.com, which was created using the burner phone ending in 1697. The same number linked to the Tinder account. The name for this email was under Andy Roberts, which again, Andrew is Rex's middle name. And he also used the fake birthday of August 6, 1972. The email's terms and services services were accepted at the IP address of 24184-7531, which just happens to be the same IP address as Rex's home in Massapequa Park. Now, the birthday used to create the account is significant because investigators also discovered another email using those same exact numbers. The email that was discovered was thawk080672 at gmail.com, and this was created under another fake name called Thomas Hawk and with the burner phone ending in 2671. Now when this email was discovered and I just want to put a trigger warning because what I am going to say is disturbing. Detectives discovered thousands of lewd searches involving porn, violence, child corn. Some researchers included the phrase quote Asian twink, which is a quote, perversion for liking pornography about Asian men. And he also had searched black girl 10 years old, which stands out because of the John Doe that was found, which again was an Asian male, and because of the baby Doe that was found, who was an African American girl. These searches are just absolutely sick. Like they make me feel so, so gross. The fact that he was searching black girl 10 years old. I mean, this guy is just sick. There's also a lot of other sick searches, which I won't include here because they're just absolutely horrible. And investigators said that these searches and just what they found really shows you how evil and sick this man is. On top of all of this, detectives also discovered that Rex had searched for information related to the Gilgo Beach killings. Yeah, he was looking into the case. These searches were made between March 2022 and June of 2023. I will put a photo from the bail document, but I'm just going to read you a couple of them. He searched, why could law enforcement not trace the calls made by the Long Island serial killer? Why hasn't the Long Island serial killer been caught? Long Island serial killer update. Cops launch Gilgo Beach Homicide Investigation Task Force and mapping the Long Island murder victims. So he was scouring the internet for information about the Long Island serial killer as well as the layout of where the bodies were found. He was compulsively looking at photos of the victims and and also trying to track down their relatives, which again, like, it's just absolutely disturbing that he was doing this. I mean, did he just want to enjoy this and kind of, you know, relive everything that he did? Or was he scared that he was going to get caught soon and just wanted to see what was going on with the investigation? It's just very disturbing to think about him doing that. The fact that he searched, why hasn't the Long Island serial killer been caught is crazy because he's literally the serial killer. I just, it's honestly scary to know that serial killers can be listening to these documentaries and watching these podcasts and just like reading stuff about them and just keeping up to date with what investigators know. There was this one girl, I believe her name is Nikki, and she came forward and said that she had actually gone on a date with Rex in the past and that she was so creeped out by him because on this date, he asked her, are you into true crime? And she was like, well, yeah, I listened to true crime. Like, let's talk about it. And so they started talking about like different serial killers and just, you know, different cases. And and then all of a sudden, Rex asked her, do you know anything about the Long Island serial killer? And Nikki was like, yeah, of course I do. Like, I know who he is. I know what's going on. Like, it's crazy that they haven't caught him yet. And, you know, while... Nikki was being empathetic to the victims and was actually concerned that this guy was still on the loose and that these cases were unsolved. She says that Rex seemed like excited to talk about the Long Island serial killer. That as soon as Nikki said, yeah, I know who he is, that he was like, oh, okay, perfect. Like, let's talk about this. Like, it's crazy they haven't caught him yet. Like, what do you think he did with the bodies? Or how do you think he killed them? And that he was just asking questions in a way where it seemed like he was getting excited about this. Nikki just felt so comfortable because she's like yeah i like true crime but i'm not going to sit here and talk about it as if it's some type of like fun gossip what did you think when you first saw him oh my god he's massive at the time i was you know 20 
four years old. I was like 120, 130 pounds, and you know, hadn't had kids yet. And he was a gigantic man. Like I had to look up at him, gigantic. We sat down, he seemed perfectly normal at first. He seemed like your typical guy who was bored with his life, you know, and wanted some kind of excitement. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It didn't get weird until he asked me if I was a true crime fan. It was when he said, well, do you know about the Gilgo Beach, the Gilgo Beach murders? He actually brought it up. Yeah, he said, to, he has said to me exactly, do you know about the Gilgo Beach murders? And I was like, yeah, I'm from Long Island. Everybody from Long Island knows about them, you know what I mean? Um, and that's when he started talking about it. But here's the thing. When he brought it up, his whole demeanor changed. It, it he, he sat up straighter, you know? He had like a smirk on his face. He seemed almost like too excited to talk about it. And then once he did start talking about it, it didn't seem like a true crime fan who just knows information they've seen on TV or read. It seemed like somebody who was reliving it. One, one thing I remember specifically was he said to me, how do you think they get rid of the bodies without going notice? And he said, what if they treaded through the marsh the, with the burlap sacks? You would never see them. Uh, he's like, it's a very dark and desolate area. I just can't even imagine how eerie that is to be Nikki and to look back and think of like, oh my gosh, I was on a dinner date with a Long Island serial killer while he was talking to me about the Long Island serial killer and how the case was still unsolved. And again, he was literally asking her questions of like, how do you think he did it? And like, where did he put the bodies? And you know, what do you think went through their mind in their last moments? It's just absolutely eerie and I just, ugh, I can't. Anyways, investigators also linked Rex to these burner phones by video surveillance. Rex was seen on May 19th, 2023 at a T-Mobile in Midtown Manhattan, adding minutes to the burner phone ending in 2671 and he was also seen paying in cash. So there are quite a bit of very clear ties between Rex and these burner phones. Along with all of this, investigators also discovered that Rex had gotten his hands on a data wiping software such as Easy Hide IP and Shredder X that would wipe clean his electronic devices. So yeah, he was basically trying to wipe all of his searches just in case he ever did get caught. You know, police wouldn't be able to find find all of his CP and all of these searches and just everything. So all of this information revealed a lot, but investigators had to be so sure and just have evidence be very airtight before making an arrest. They needed DNA linking him to the murders. So let's talk about DNA. Maureen's body was tied together at the feet, ankles, and legs using leather belts. On one of the belts, a single female hair was discovered on the belt buckle and forensics determined that it belonged to a quote, Caucasian head hair fragment. Another important discovery that can now possibly be linked with Rex is that one of the three belts used had been engraved with the letters WH, or if you look at it reversed, it's HM. Now, Suffolk County District Attorney Ray T. Tierney said, quote, yes, there was WH or HM on the belt. The last name is Hearman. There are ancestors with WH, so assign to that what you will. Rex's grandfather was named William Hurman, as well as his uncle, who was William Hurman Jr. So it could be something else used as evidence against him, you know, that, that this is his belt that either his grandfather gave him or his uncle, and that's why it has those specific initials. Next, Megan's body was found bound by tape, and forensics found two female hairs on her body that had Caucasian slash European characteristics. Amber's body was also bound by tape, and forensics found one female human hair that also had Caucasian and European characteristics. When these hairs were submitted for DNA analysis, it was determined that these hairs did not belong to any of the victims, but that they all did belong to one single female. On July 21st, 2022, an undercover detective collected 11 bottles from Rex's trash bins outside of his home and took swabs that were sent to the lab for DNA profiling. The results didn't come back until the following year on February 24th, 2023. And they determined that the DNA from the bottles outside of Rex's home matched the female hairs on the victims. Investigators believed that these hairs belonged to Rex's wife, 
ASA. In June of 2023, forensics concluded that, quote, 99.98% of the North American population can be excluded from the female hair on Costello, and 99.69% of the North American population are excluded from the female hair on Waterman. It is significant that RH's wife cannot be excluded from either of the female hairs recovered on the remains of Megan Waterman and Amber Costello. The bail document also goes on to say that ASA was was actually out of state at the time of Megan and Amber's disappearances slash murders, so her hairs that were found on the body's victims were most likely transferred from Rex since they shared a home. So like, maybe her hair got on his jacket or like his jeans, and so when he was committing these crimes, his wife's hairs accidentally fell on the victims. So this DNA analysis was good news. Investigators were just getting so close to finally making an arrest. DNA from Rex's daughter, Victoria, was also collected for analysis. Investigators actually followed her onto a train, and when she got off at Penn Station, investigators recovered a can of Monster Java energy drink that she had thrown in the trash. Her DNA also matched the DNA profiles on the ones found on the Gilgo 4. Now, they had Victoria's DNA and they also had Ace's DNA, but police still needed DNA from Rex. When Megan's skeletal remains were being examined, forensics discovered a male hair at the very bottom of the burlap that she was wrapped in. At the time, it was unsuitable for DNA testing, so it was kept safely locked away until 2020, when it was tested again and it was determined that it had Caucasian slash European characteristics. In late 2022, investigators tried to obtain DNA from a cup that Rex had thrown in the trash, but they could not get a good enough sample to test it. Detectives were simply just waiting for their next chance to finally get something with Rex's DNA on it to match it to the male hair found on Megan. Well, that day came on January 26, 2023. A surveillance team that was following Rex collected a pizza box that he had thrown away in the trash in Manhattan, and they took this pizza to the lab where swabs were taken from a few pieces of crust that Rex left behind. In June of 2023, the results came in. The male hair found on Megan and the swabs from the pizza crust were a match, meaning while 99.96% of the North American population can be excluded from the male hair on Waterman, it is significant that Rex Hureman cannot be. So that was it. Rex was their guy. This was huge. On July 13th, 2023, Rex was arrested as he was leaving his office in Midtown Manhattan. He was approached by authorities who were not in uniform, they were actually wearing suits to be exact, and they arrested Rex with no resistance. At the time of his arrest, Rex had on him the burner phone ending in 2671, which again we discussed earlier. After his arrest, his name was just everywhere in the media, in every headline, in every article, he was all over social media, he was just like everywhere, like this was really really big news. I mean, I even remember when the news broke Twitter, I literally read the article and I was like, what? Are you serious? Like they finally caught the Long Island serial killer? But I was so happy that now the victim's families were just one step closer to justice. After his arrest, Rex was indicted in the killings of Melissa, Megan, and Amber, but he pled not guilty. The judge, Richard Ambro, denied him bail due to the extreme depravity of the crime he is accused of committing, and he was sent to prison and was placed on suicide watch. It wasn't until recently that this year, on January 16th, 2024, that Rex was also charged with the second degree murder in the killing of Maureen. So, Rex is now being charged for the murders of the Gilgo Four. When Maureen's daughter heard the news, she said, quote, While the loss of my mom has been extremely painful for me, the indictment by the grand jury has brought hope for justice for my mom and my family. Maureen's sister also spoke out and said, quote, Maureen was a mother of two amazing children and they will forever be without their mother. Maureen was my older sister who was always there for me when I needed her. It's just so sad. I just, I can't imagine how the families felt hearing the news that there was finally an arrest. Now, Rex pled not guilty to everything, and according to his attorney, Michael Brown, Rex has, quote, maintained his innocence since day one. And he also added that all along we've been told there's no nuclear DNA, and now for the first time 13 years later, what was once unsuitable, we couldn't get a DNA profile from a nuclear basis, is now nuclear capable. We're going to look into that. It's problematic. So we will see what happens with that and learn more information 
as it comes out. So yeah, I mean, Rex really hasn't made any statements or like done any interviews, nothing like that. You know, of course, I'm sure his lawyer is telling him to not say anything. But as of now, he has pled not guilty. After his arrest, investigators focused on searching Rex's home and storage units he had to see if they could find any more evidence. Since according to travel records, Rex's family was out of town during the murders of the Gilgo Four, detectives honestly believe that maybe Rex actually committed these murders inside his own home, which wouldn't be that shocking. You know, it would make more sense for Rex to do it all in his own home where, you know, he is in control of the situation and could have more easily bound the victims with his own materials and, you know, things like that. So investigators searched Rex's home and they did find some disturbing things in the span of 12 days. First of all, his house is a disaster, like really messy, cluttered, and just very disorganized. So it was really hard for investigators to kind of like dig through things because it was just like a hot mess. Neighbors said that while everyone else's house on the street was, you know, well taken care of and maintained nice with their yard work and things like that, Rex's house stood out like a sore thumb because it looked like no one cared to maintain it. Even the outside of the house was very cluttered. So detectives dismantled his wooden deck and they also dug up his backyard using ground penetrating radar, a backhoe, and a police dog in the search for additional evidence. There really wasn't anything in the backyard, but inside, police did find a vault. A very big vault that you could literally walk into. And this was behind a metal door that stashed 297 guns, of which he only had licenses for 92. A former co-worker came forward and said that he recalls Rex taking time off from work so that he could install a, a concrete lined vault in his home. They said, quote, it's not just a hidden room, it's a serious vault. It had a huge heavy duty safe door. He went and poured new concrete walls, massive amounts of concrete to encase this room. It was maybe two or three feet thick. According to police, they stated that there could be evidence showing that he has killed in this vault room before. Now, we don't know exactly what evidence they are talking about because of course, like, I get that police have to keep things very hush-hush since there is a trial happening so they don't want to jeopardize anything. So we don't know exactly what evidence they found, but like the fact that they made that statement saying that it's possible he could have killed in there before is just so eerie and just so insane. Now, some of the things that police pulled from the house were a large doll in a glass case, a large portrait of a woman with a bruised face, and a filing cabinet. So we'll see what other information comes out. It's just, I know I've said this so many times, but it's just crazy to think about him living this like secret double life. I mean, creating all of these fake emails and using multiple burner phones and making a Tinder account and contacting escorts and just doing all of this stuff is so sad. And I just can't imagine how the family feels knowing all of this. When the news of Rex's arrest came out, neighbors, old co-workers, old classmates, and lifelong friends were in complete shock. No one could believe it. And especially Rex's own family. His wife, Asa, said that she was absolutely blind blindsided by everything and she actually filed for divorce after Rex's arrest. She said that their children cry themselves to sleep. She said she is disgusted and embarrassed by what her husband did. She said that their home was turned completely upside down during the search and that everything was left a complete disaster. She said she doesn't even know where to lay down anymore as their beds were taken but she says that she has no other choice but to continue living in this home. Asa said quote, I had three cats. Litter boxes were strew, thrown on top top of everything. My pictures were thrown all over the place. My couch was completely shredded. There was a pelican case in my house which had clothes in it and inside of a pelican case they have foam. I was able to take two pieces of the foam and put it together so that I could lay down. Asa said she is working with the district attorney in regards for the damages made to her house which is really really sad because I get it that police were looking for evidence and that they needed to go through every inch of the house just to make sure that nothing was left unturned. But like, God, like it must suck for the families too because they're innocent in this. Like what did the children have to do with this? And the fact that their rooms are destroyed, their beds are destroyed, their house is just like a mess and they just have to deal with it themselves is, I just feel like that's not right. Now, the public has split opinions about Asa, you know, whether she did or didn't know about what her husband was doing or just about her involvement in all of this is being questioned. Her lawyer, Robert, said that Asa, quote, 
quote, wants to believe that the spouse she's been married to for 27 years wasn't capable of these crimes. She wants to see and hear the evidence as it plays out in the courtroom. Now, a lot of people judge her for saying that, but just like put yourself in her shoes. If you just found out that the husband that you've had for the past, you know, 20 years, the father of your children was a serial killer, I feel like most people would doubt that and just like not believe it right away. Like I'm trying to picture someone telling me that my fiance was a killer. I don't think right away I'd be like, yeah, that's true. Like my, he's a killer. I feel like most people's instinct is to be like, what? No, that's not possible. Like what is going on? So I totally understand, you know, Asa wanting to believe that the man that she has loved for all these years isn't actually a monster. Melissa Moore, who is the daughter of the happy face killer, decided to show support for Asa and just everything that she went through since she gets how it is to be terribly blindsided by finding out that someone close to you isn't who you think. She actually created a GoFundMe to help Asa get back on her feet and to also help pay for her medical bills because Asa has skin and breast cancer. So most of the money raised on this GoFundMe will be for her medical treatment. Melissa put, quote, Today, I have an opportunity to use my voice to help Asa, who isn't in a place to speak about the terror and horror she and her family are experiencing at this moment. Another person who came forward was the daughter of the BTK killer, Carrie Rawson who said, quote, Asa and her kids are also victims. So a lot of people were just not happy about support being shown because a lot of people really believed that she was involved or that she at least had knowledge that her husband was doing these things. Again, I don't know. I mean, if there is evidence that comes out showing that she did know about this, you know, things like that, then of course that's terrible. But as of now, it truly seems like Rex's family had no idea. As for Rex's kids, according to an article written by Fox News, Rex's two children are constantly having to reevaluate what is happening to them, almost in real time. Obviously, the deplorable conditions that their house was left in, you know, torn apart from the floorboards to the shingles, basically is their paramount concern. They're trying to regain some basic sense of normalcy, which is completely impossible at this point. They're living in a surreal, walking horror show. It is really sad. I believe the kids are... 26 and 33. So they're not little children, but I feel like that makes it even, I don't want to say worse, but even harder because they are of age where they can access the internet to read about what their father has done. They can hear the news. They understand when reporters are outside of their house harassing them. So it's really, really sad because just imagine finding this information out about your father. I have seen video clips of journalists outside of the family's home just asking questions about what their husband did, about what their father did, asking for statements. And I just feel like that is wrong. I mean, his children are also victims in this situation and they are going through something unimaginable. So they definitely should not be harassed by reporters. Now, something that further angered people was the news that Peacock, the streaming service, is coming out with a documentary about the trial and will also be paying Asa to participate. She showed up in a court appearance with a Peacock filming crew, so it looks like this project is actually moving forward. Suffolk County District Attorney Ray Tierney said, quote, she's trying to capitalize on her husband's notoriety and make herself marketable, but the truth isn't always marketable and the money itself could be a motivation to lie. They also added that this can affect all of her credibility. Someone who also showed their disapproval of this documentary was John Ray, the lawyer who represents Shannon Gilbert's family and Jessica Taylor's family. He said, quote, what she says can be used against her criminally. They are all walking on extremely thin legal ice. She's still within the circle of suspicion in this case, and so are the children. Anything she says is very dangerous. Ultimately, the district attorney, Ray Tierney, said that this just isn't a good idea, but that it really comes down to the decision the jury makes based on facts and evidence and not what is stated in a documentary made by Peacock. Now, a Peacock representative spoke out and said that Asa isn't getting paid for her participation, but was given a licensing fee so that the company could use her archival materials and that any money she receives cannot go towards Rex nor his defense. So we will see what happens with that documentary and just with all of that. I mean, I don't know. What do you guys think? Oh, as for like movies made about him, I mentioned in part one that Netflix released Lost Girls in 2020, which is a really good movie. I just recently rewatched it like two days ago after uploading part one, and it's 
pretty accurate to the case. So definitely recommend that you guys check that out. There's also a Lifetime movie called The Gilgo Beach Killer that aired in August of 2023. So that's pretty much where the case stands today. The only new possible leads that have come out recently was from a taxi driver and from witness statements. In a press conference that was held with Shannon's family lawyer, John Ray, and police commissioner Rodney Harrison, John says that a female witness came forward who we will refer to as Katie. Katie came forward after seeing Rex's photo in the news, saying that she recognized him. Katie said that in 2009, she was working as a taxi driver and arrived at a motel to pick up someone. And when she arrived, she saw someone matching Rex's description, leaving the motel and trying to hide his face with his arms. After that, she saw Shannon Gilbert leave the motel and get into her taxi. She said that Shannon was disheveled and said that the quote, John that she just met lied to her and, and promised to give her a thousand dollars, but gave her an envelope with pieces of cut paper inside instead. When she found it, she locked herself in the bathroom and called for the cab. Katie went on to say how weeks after this incident with Shannon happened, she was dispatched to pick up a man from a bar. Upon entering the cab, she said that this man told her he was going to change his destination and that they were going for a long drive in the woods. And then she heard a gun click. This man also told her that he wanted to kill her. She refused and this man ended up getting out of the cab because her dispatcher thankfully heard the entire thing and said that she was going to call 911. Now, Katie says that this man was the same guy from the incident with Shannon, aka allegedly Rex Heuerman. Now, Rodney Harrison said that they're working on confirming the credibility of the statements, so we will see. You know, I hope this really does lead to something, but if this is true, then that means that Shannon and Rex did meet before her death. And again, you know, some investigators don't believe that Shannon is one of this Long Island serial killer victims. But again, if this is true that Rex and Shannon did have this interaction, then maybe she is a victim of Rex as well. The second witness that came forward said that on Valentine's Day in 1996, she and her boyfriend were at a swingers club in New York and they saw an ad on the bulletin board about a swinger couple. So they decided to go to this house on the ad, but before they arrived, they picked up Karen Vergata to join them. Which, if you recall, Karen went missing on exactly the same Valentine's Day in 1996 and was found on Gilgo Beach after police found the Gilgo 4. According to the witnesses, when they arrived, they were greeted by none other than Rex Huerman and his wife, Asa. The witnesses state that Asa told them that Rex brought her here from Iceland and that she was given all she has. She also said something odd though. She said that she was afraid of Rex, but didn't elaborate. As a couple was about to leave the home and get inside their car, they actually saw Karen running out of the house naked and the witnesses got really scared and thought that they should help her. But you know, the boyfriend just told her that they must be playing a game or you know, some kind of role play and to not worry worry about it. So they left. The witness said, quote, I was shocked and deeply sorrowful for having left her behind at Huriman's house. I told John Ray of these things because I needed to speak with him so that Karen would not be left behind again. So we will see what happens with this. I do just want to emphasize that this is not confirmed yet. These are just like witness statements made. I'm sure when the trial happens, like these statements would probably be confirmed by then or, you know, further elaborated. So again, I just want to say that all of this is just alleged information. If these allegations are true, this might tie up Asa and the whole thing after all, because, you know, if she literally did meet one of the victims, which was Karen, then that's pretty crazy. The Gilbert family lawyer, John Ray, has made it very clear that he believes Asa does have knowledge about Rex's actions, but authorities are still actively investigating Ray for the other Gilgo Beach murders and police commissioner Rodney Harrison said, quote, we're not done. Rex is a demon that walks among us, a predator that ruined families. There is this interview that Rex did with this YouTube channel, which I'll put on the screen here in 2022. And it's just really scary watching him in real time. I'll try to include a clip of it here, but I'm not sure if it's going to get like copyright striked. So if it does, I will have it link down below so you guys can check it out. Tell us, you know, who you are, uh, you know, where you're from and how long you've been in New York. Okay. Like um, Rex Huerman, I'm an architect. I'm an architectural consultant. I'm a troubleshooter. Born and raised on Long Island. Okay. Been right. working in Manhattan since 1987. That's it, folks. That was Rex, owner, founder of RH Consultant. 
So if you have any building regulatory issues, please contact him. He's probably gonna solve your issues, okay? Uh, guys, you know the drill. Uh, comment, share, like, subscribe. Subscribe, very important. But in the meantime, it's... Selfie time. Selfie time. You're fast. Ready? One, two, three. Ah! Can you smile? That is. It's just really odd to watch Rex in this type of environment and just see him speak and, you know, be so proud of his job, just acting like a normal guy, you know, as if he hasn't just killed all of these people and is an evil man and is the Long Island serial killer. Now, apart from his possible involvement in the other Gilgo Beach victims, the investigation has now spread to Las Vegas, Nevada and Chester, South Carolina. Rex actually owns some properties in these cities, so it's very possible that they can get some answers to unsolved cases over there. In Vegas, Rex purchased two timeshare condos and in South Carolina, he had four large parcels of land near his brother Craig. Now these adjacent properties lead to a large pond in the back where people keep boats. Neighbors of Craig say that he told them Rex would be retiring soon and going to live there and would buy out everyone who lives around them. Which makes a lot of people think like is he trying to retire to this area where there's like a big pond and buy out all of of these neighbors so that he can use this new spot as his hunting ground as like an isolated area where he can leave the bodies in a pond without any of the neighbors seeing it's just all really eerie like i said this case just gets deeper and deeper it's just so massive and just so much more information is going to come out soon as of now this is pretty much everything for part two i just can't believe that all of this happened because police decided to finally look into dave's tip about the green chevy avalanche after a decade like if this new task force wasn't created would this case still be unsolved i did read that this task force is now going to focus on on the other six bodies that were found to see if they're connected to Rex or to see if someone else committed these murders. I'm happy that they are going to investigate those deaths further because, you know, they also need justice. Suffolk County Executive Steve Ballone said, quote, We have never stopped working on this case. There are police officers who have retired now, but their efforts, their dedication, it has never stopped. The work is not done here, but this is a major step forward in achieving the goal that we have had from the beginning, and that is, again to bring closure to these families and to bring justice to the victims in this case. When Megan Waterman's family heard about the arrest, they said that they felt anger but also relief. They stated that Rex doesn't look capable of what he did and that they were really shocked that this was Megan's killer. They just also cannot believe that 13 years have gone by. But all right, you guys, that is pretty much everything I have for today's video. I really appreciate you guys being here and taking the time to listen to this incredibly upsetting, heartbreaking, and just sad case. My thoughts and prayers go out to the families and to the victims. I truly hope that they do receive justice and closure. It's all just so evil and just so sad all of this is just like too much to even think about you know if rex really did do this this six four six five six six dude was attacking these young petite women and i just can't imagine how scared they must have felt in that final moment like truly what can you do in that situation you know without a weapon how can you fight off a huge guy these beautiful girls did not deserve this and you know this man had absolutely no right to take their lives suffolk county crime stoppers is still off offering a reward for more information on this case. So if you do know anything, you can submit information online to Crime Stoppers by visiting p3tips.com or by calling 1-800-220-TIPS or visit gilgonews.com to submit anonymous tips online. All of my sources for this video will be linked down below. Again, if we missed something or we misspoke, please let me know in the comments down below so we can correct and update as needed. Thank you guys again so much for being here and I will see you all in the next video. Bye guys!